one step above God. That's what the McCall whalers of the Pacific Northwest said about the orca. The Haida Indians of the Queen Charlotte Islands believes that the killer whale is the most powerful being in the world. An Indian in Namu, British Columbia, felt likewise when he said that the orcas are like gods. An Eskimo said that the orca is the soul of man. The Indian of Japan believed that the killer whale was the ruler of the deep sea. As Gary Snyder said, every culture that knows the orca feels the same about it. is when we die our spirit will be born of a baby killer whale we will live the life of that killer whale and when the killer whale dies our spirit will be released to the everlasting potlatch or our heaven the magma you'll always see usually a human face incorporated into the design or the carving not symbolizing the afterlife of the hunters the sea hunters in old or in my belief, the hunters of nowadays, when we die, our spirits will be released and we will go into the domain or the life of the Magamuk for a short period. I'll go out in the fog and I'll interact with the whales. I'll get close with the boat and I'll sit there and I'll just talk to the whales as they pass. Kela Kasla Magamuk. Welcome home, killer whales. Welcome back to our home. When I go out there and see them and watch them swim under the boat and every now and then maybe stick my hand out if they're close enough and touch them, it's just my way of interacting with some of the people in my family who have passed on in the last few years. Some legends tell that families, their first people, their origin crests are the Magano, killer whale. And those people, they came about being on earth because the creator put animals, mountains and trees on this great earth. And then later on, the brother of his, the Transformer, came across the great land. And when he swept across the world, he transformed mountains, trees, supernatural, spiritual animals, as well as natural animals into the first humans. And some of our families, they originated from the transformation from Magano into human. Even the scientists nowadays can't figure out where does the Magano go during the winter time. They come here into the Johnson Straits and feed in salmon, ones they call the transients, harvest seals. But in the winter time, they disappear. They leave our shores and head west out into the great ocean and are not seen again until the following year. While our legends tell that the Magano go to a big house out in the ocean, that's where they live, like our people lived in big houses at one time. I even heard one story about how the Magano, when they get to an island where their big house is, they transform into half human, half killer whale. They walk from the water and they occupy their winter home. And they live there and they dance as our people used to, reminisce about their great hunting exploits they had in Johnson Straits and the salmon and herring. And then in spring when the salmons return, so do the Magano. They go back walk down their beach, transform into the Magano of the water, and they swim back to our shores and our waters, and they come and interact with everything and interact with the humans one-on-one. -on -one. Scientific mythology about the orca isn't much different. This largest of the dolphin family, with a larger brain than the humans, is the dominant predator of the marine world. Until recently dominated by humans, the orca ruled the oceans of the world for thousands of years. Unlike the dominant species on Earth, the human, the lion and wolf, the orca does not make war. Dr. Randall Eaton started studying the orca in 1976. Prior to that, he spent 10 years studying the large carnivores. He is convinced that in certain fundamental ways, humans are more like the social carnivores than other primates. In the scientific journal Carnivore, 
Dr. Eaton wrote that while big game hunting was important to the origin of human behavior, humans succeeded at hunting only as well as they could defend the animals they killed from other predators. It doesn't do any good to kill big animals if you can't eat them. Once the animal hits the ground, everybody wants it. We've all seen what happens on the plains of Africa. It's a war between species for the carcasses. We forget that humans were right in the middle of it for hundreds of thousands of years. He thinks that humans won the lion's share by waging a long, bloody war against dangerous carnivores. Once humans climbed the top of the predatory ladder, other humans became their primary competitors and enemies, and warfare between groups of humans began in earnest. When the human, in most places, not all, there's still some places where other creatures rule the landscape, not many, but a few. But in most places on this planet, when the human walks into an environment, to any habitat, the other creatures there yield to us. Now there's four species on this planet that might be able to teach us something about how to rule ourselves and how to govern our relationship with our environment. There's not many. There's the lion, there's the wolf, and there's the orca whale. We're the other dominant species. What I'm suggesting to you is that our real problem here on this planet is learning how to govern appropriately for our own benefit and for the benefit of the circle of life in which we sit. So that's why my attention then turned to what is it that dominant creatures can teach us? Well, the wolves kill the wolves. When there's an intruder in the wolf territory, the pack attacks it and kills it. The lions kill the lions. Males are always forming armies and they're going out and that's how they get ahead in this world. Uh, they displace other males who are with females. At least that's their effort. They may not win, but that's what they try to do. And they wage lethal war to gain right to those females in the territory they live in. It's happening all the time in lion country. We humans behave pretty much the same way. We've been competing for resources uh, for God knows how long, and uh, wife stealing probably was one of the first forms of, of warfare. Uh, not much different really than the lions. So when we come to the orca, we're stymied. The orcas don't make war. And it's a puzzle. Many people say to me when I point this out, because to me it's a, it's a great mystery, uh, why they don't. They say, well, there are so many resources in the sea. But according to ecological principles, that argument won't hold up. If there's that many resources in the sea, there's going to be that many more orcas at some point in time. And they're going to find themselves coming into competition. The lack of competition in mating is surprising in orcas. We find it in virtually every species that we've ever studied. But we get to the orca and we find a totally different kind of society. It's a true matriarchy. The only one outside of social insects that exists. The females lead the social group. The males who are their offspring stay with them throughout their lives and help raise other young. They only leave their groups to mate with females of other groups and then return after a short period of time. But there's no competition among males for a female orca who's receptive for mating. Based on his studies in Northern British Columbia, Dr. John Ford believes that the females in another group make the decision about which male they want to come and fertilize the female member of their group who's ready to reproduce. Why the orcas relate to us as they do is another mystery. Uh, Imagine catching a fully grown lion and riding it three days later, <laughs> climbing on its back and walking around a cage, or doing a circus show, uh, riding wild lions taken out of wild Africa. We can't imagine that. We can't imagine doing it with grizzly bears. But we do that with orca whales. Why is it they are tame towards humans? Why is it that they may even capture themselves?